we are here with the Dutch cardiologist and pioneer near-death researcher, Dr. Pien van Lamo. Welcome. You're welcome. So for those who don't know him, Dr. Van Lamo is one of the top pioneer NDE researchers and the author of a bestseller known as Consciousness Beyond Life, The Science of Near-Death Experience. This book not only talks about near-death experience, but also mentions other phenomena, including shared death experience, after-death communication, deathbed experiences, including encounters with the deceased. And he also talks about non-local consciousness, which we'll be discussing. But first of all, let's talk about how you got into this field. Well, when I started my specialization in cardiology, in 1969, I was working at one of the first coronary care units in the Netherlands. Before 1967, all patients with cardiac arrest died because modern techniques of resuscitation were not available. So the techniques of defibrillation and external chest compression were just available. And that's why coronary care units were started all over the world, also in the Netherlands. So in 1969, we had a patient who had a cardiac arrest because of an acute myocardial infarction. And we resuscitated him. We did CPR with several times defibrillation and external chest compression. And after about four minutes, regained consciousness. And we were very happy as a resuscitation team. I was the doctor in charge. I was, it was the first time we did it. But the patient was extremely disappointed and told us about the till and the light and music and beautiful landscape, etc. So that was quite striking for us, but I didn't do anything with it because I was just starting my specialization out in family with young children. So uh, I never forgot it, but I didn't do anything with it until in 1986, I read the book by George Ritchie, Return from Tomorrow, where he describes his very deep an intense near death experience as a medical student. He died in 1943 by double pneumonia and he didn't get any antibiotics. They were not available for medical students. And the nurse was so upset that this young student died that the nurse was able to persuade the medical doctor to give him an injection from adrenaline right into his heart, which was quite uncommon. And after nine minutes of being dead, he regained consciousness and had a very deep, very intense near-death experience. I've never heard about the death experience before. I did read the book by Raymond Moody in 1975. So it started for me with the book by George Ritchie. When I'd read the book, I started to interview patients who had survived the cardiac arrest in the past. And within two years, between 1986 and 1988, I had 50 patients who survived cardiac arrest. And 12 of them shared the NDE with me. And that was my, my scientific curiosity started to grow because I had learned in university and in college that it was impossible to have ex conscious experiences when you die, when you have cardiac arrest because the brain doesn't function at all. And we have learned that consciousness is a product of brain function. So that's how it started for me, scientific curiosity. So when did you first hear about Raymond Moody's research and the term near-death experience? That was after I read the book in 1986 by George Ritchie. Then I started to read books about it. Okay, I first heard about your research from Dr. Melvin Morse. He was the first to conduct research on children, and he did a prospective study. It wasn't a large-scale study like the one you did. But he talked, he talked, he talked, he talked. But he told me about your prospective study with hundreds of patients during the 1980s. And this was published in The Lancet. So I think this was the first study of its kind worldwide. Can you tell me about this study? So, as I told you before, that it should be impossible that people have conscious experience during cardiac arrest. There have been some theories also based on what Moody had found that it should be 
neurotransmitters, should be hallucination, should be lack of oxygen in the brain, should be whatever. But people didn't know how to explain the cause and content of an ND. And that's why we started in 1988, a prospective study in total of 344 consecutive survivors of cardiac arrest in 10 Dutch hospitals with the aim to find out if we could explain the cause and content of the NDE. So um, in four years, we had 344 patients who survived cardiac arrest. And we found that 18%, 62 patients reported a classical near-death experience. The 82% did not report any memory from a period of cardiac arrest. So we compared the two groups of patients with and without an ND, if we could find any significant difference between them. And to our surprise, there was no difference at all. So the severity of anoxia, lack of oxygen in the brain, if people have been have had a cardiac rest of two minutes or eight minutes, didn't matter at all. If they have been unconscious for five minutes or three weeks in coma, didn't matter at all. If they have complicated CPR with artificial respiration, didn't matter at all. If they had induced cardiac arrest in electrophysiological studies in the cath lab, didn't matter at all. So the severity of lack of oxygen in the brain, we could exclude with 100%. All patients had been unconscious because of lack of oxygen in the brain and only 80% reported a near-death experience. And there was also no psychological explanation like fear of death before the arrest. There was no medical explanation. So what they had received as medication didn't matter at all. Religion didn't matter at all. If they were atheists or Christian, didn't matter at all. Education didn't matter at all. Followers that they could know that these experiences are possible, didn't matter at all. So we, to our surprise, we found that there is no scientific explanation why patients experience a near death experience in cardiac arrest, but we know for sure that they don't have any brain function and still have an enhanced consciousness with a possibility of perception out and above the lifeless body, with uh, being aware of being dead, uh, going, coming in a dark space room, going through a tunnel to the light, to a beautiful landscape, beautiful colors, meeting deceased relatives, meeting a being of light, having a life review, we relive their whole life. Sometimes uh, we live future events as well. And then they come, come to a border where they know that when they pass this border, they'll, they'll never come back again. And then they hear a voice. They say, it's not your time yet. You have still a task for you. And then they are conscious return into the body again, which is awful for them. So that was the first part of our study. The second part that we did a longitudinal study with taped interviews two years and eight years after the cardiac arrest with all patients still alive who had an NDE and a matched control group of patients who had survived cardiac arrest with no NDE. Match control is the same age, the same gender, and the same time interval. We found that we want to know about the transformation because we know that when you have a near death experience, you will change. That is, there's no fear of death anymore. There's a new insight what is important in life. They feel connected with everybody, with every, with nature, with animals, with plants, and that's why we call it also an experience of oneness. And they have an enhanced intuitive sensitivity. And what we found that only the patient with the near death experience had this classical transformation, which means it's kind of objective proof for the subjective experience. We can get statistical analysis for this transformation. You cannot do statistical analysis for a subjective experience for a lot of people think you cannot prove anything about subjective experience, but we can talk about this later. So the, our study took 10 years and was published in 2001 in The Lancet, which was a worldwide stir. It was on the front page of all papers in the world, indeed. Wow, that was amazing. So among these commonalities, where there is one that a lot of the people I have researched a lot of the near-death experiencers I have interviewed mention one of the commonalities that also you mentioned and most of the NDE researchers mention, which is an encounter with the light. This light, you, you mentioned on page 28 of your book, Consciousness Beyond Life, you describe this light 
as an extremely bright but non-blinding light. It, it usually uh, fills them with love, unconditional love. They also have access to deep knowledge and wisdom. So how do you think, excuse me, although this is experienced differently by different people, there is this commonality. However, people seem to interpret it differently. You mentioned that some people interpret it as Jesus or an angel or simply a being of light. And you also mentioned that the religious background of the person has a significant influence in how they interpret this being of light or this light. Can you tell me a little bit more about this? Why do different people have different interpretations? Well, the problem is the death experience is an ineffable experience. There are no words for it to express it. So you use words and ideas from your own culture background, from your religion, from your age. Children will use different words as adults, and Christians will use different words as Muslims or atheists or Buddhists. So it's depending on your background where you will find words for it. But what they try to tell you is in essence the same. But still, it is an ineffable experience. And, and the light you mentioned, well, it's more than 1,000 cents and you still can look at it. It's such a bright light and it is with the feeling of unconditional love, with the feeling of acceptance, feeling of wisdom. It's all at the same. But again, there was one study done in Eastern Germany where the people were atheists and they just talk about a light and nothing more. So the interpretation there was a light. When you talk to Hindus, they perhaps talk about Brahma or, or Buddhists about Buddha and Christians talk about Jesus and other people will talk about being of light. So it depends on your background. There's another thing that people also mention and that you also mentioned in your book that is this in contrast with this light, there's also like a dark place where you cannot see anything except darkness. Is that something you also found? Yeah, about 10 to 20% of people with a positive near-death experience come first in this dark area, but which can be frightening as well. And then they see a small spot of light where they're attracted to. And with a great speed, they go to the light and they, they describe it as the tunnel. So from this dark space, you go to the light by the tunnel. Okay, so yeah, this a dark place has been described like the void, they call it. But it, it is really dark and it does precede this encounter with the light. You also mentioned one case about a woman who was born blind. And yeah. during her NDE, she could see, I think her name was Vicky. Can you tell yeah. me about her? Yeah, that was described by Ken Ring in his book. Mind side. And she was blind from birth because she was premature as a small baby. And she get 100% oxygen. And when you get 100% oxygen as a small baby, your eyeball and your optical nerve will not grow anymore. So she was born blind because of the 100% oxygen she got. She had never been able to see. But when she had the death experience at the age of 21, when there was a traffic accident where she was in the car, for the first time ever, she could perceive. She didn't see because she was blind, but she could perceive her surroundings. She could perceive somewhere, someone lying there, and she recognized the ring. She could feel, and she could recognize the hair of her. And then she went through the ceiling outside the hospital. For the first time in life, she could see trees and and houses, etc. Which was when you are born blind, you don't have any pictures of when you're dreaming. There's no thing, nothing you can know about it, but because he was perceiving now, because you don't see with your eyes, may you have a perception, may you're out of your body. You also mentioned this phenomena, which is related to what you just said about non-local consciousness. You mentioned that 
consciousness is not a product of the brain, but it can exist without the body, without the brain. So how do you explain this? Well, people who tell us about the death experience can tell us about the life review when they they relive the whole life from, from birth, sometimes from before birth, and they know everything from the people who were involved in everything what happens to them as well. They feel the consciousness of others as well. So when you took something from your small sister, you know how sad she was, you feel how sad she was. You can also have future events as well. So when you are in this realm, there's no time and no space. People can have been in cardiac arrest for five minutes, but then they can talk for one week what happened to them. Everything happens at the same moment. The moment they concentrate on a person, they, they see him. They concentrate on a place, he will be there. So at the same moment, instantaneously, there is no time and no space. The consciousness is everywhere at the same time. And that's the concept we know from quantum physics. Non-locality means there's no time, no space, and everything is connected instantaneously. And that's why we call it a non-local consciousness. So it's an analogy with quantum physics. It's not an, ex uh, uh, it's not an explanation of the, death, of the death experience, but it's an analogy to understand how consciousness can function beyond the brain. Do you think near-death experiences are related to mystical dreams? Let me expand on this. Do you think the dream world is related to the spiritual world? Sometimes, yes. I think the dream world is also non-local realm of, of consciousness because you can also have prognostic dreams. You can dream about something that will happen in the future. So they are in the non-local realm as well. You can have lucid dreams that you know that you're dreaming. You can change the content of your dream as well. So dreams are sometimes like the death experience. Let's like say you're in, you can be in a non-local realm as well. We have heard of many uh, stories in the Bible and in other spiritual texts where an angel appears in a dream or God talks to you in the dream. I think God talked to Abraham in a dream, and also an angel appeared to Joseph before telling him that he would have a son, that he was, would be called Jesus. So uh, I, I think that, like you say, some dreams commu have communication or have a gateway to the spiritual world. And the question is, what did people tell, was written about in the Bible? Was it a dream? Or was it a conscious experience during a dream? When you have the after-death communication, when the people who are deceased, deceased relatives, try to contact you, they usually do it during sleep because the threshold of consciousness is lower when you sleep. You're easy, more easy accessible. So people tell me, I had a dream about my deceased partner or child of, of, of parent, father, mother, but they are not dreaming because they are in contact with the consciousness of deceased relatives. So it's not a dream. So what you tell about the Bible, that was conscious contact with God or with, with an angel. So it was direct contact with the non-local realm. It's not a dream because never the, this kind of contact you will never forget. When you have an after death communication in the night, you will never forget it. And it also in the Bible, what you what you refer to, you will never forget. Usually you forget a dream. But this kind of experience you will never forget. So people in the terminal phase of illness, usually in hospices of also at home, they can have contact with the enhanced aspect of our consciousness so you can they can see deceased relatives a mother a child who are coming to get them they see light the angels they see a beautiful landscape and usually is it in the last days or weeks of their life and what is special is that they can talk about it as well when you have a near-death experience you're unconscious 
but an end of life experience you can communicate about because you have your in and out you're in this physical world in a waking conscious and you're in the in the higher dimensions of your consciousness and there have been a study done in in switzerland by the about 18 80 percent of people who are dying will have end of life experiences but usually they're not recognized as such they're seen as hallucinations side effects of drugs or terminal confusion but they're real and they're real they, 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 it is a real experience of enhanced consciousness how would you respond to those people that believe that NDEs are simply the result of brain activity or hallucinations. Well, they should read my study. <laughs> I read my book, I read my article. Because usually people who think this have the materialistic approach have what I call it willful ignorance and prejudice. They don't know the literature. And the problem for a lot of scientists and materialistic scientists is that only that is true what we can objectify, what we can measure, what we can duplicate, what we can falsify, which is the physical world. But what you think or what you feel, your consciousness, you cannot objectify, you cannot measure, you cannot duplicate, you cannot falsify. This consciousness is beyond the material, materialist science. And that's why a lot of people have problem with it. People think that everything can be explained by the brain. But when you have studied near-death experiences in patients with cardiac arrest, then you know that when the brain doesn't function at all, you have paradoxically an enhanced consciousness with emotions, with cognition, with memories, with future events, etc., which should be totally impossible and consciousness is a product of brain function. Can you share with us some of the most profound NDE stories you have encountered during your research? Well, there are so many. But I think one of the, main, the most striking was a man of 44 who was found in a meadow about 30 minutes before he was brought into a hospital. So people found this man unconscious and called the ambulance and started to do some simple resuscitation. And then when he was brought into a hospital, the coronary care unit, he had no blood pressure, no heartbeat. He was totally unconscious, had already was already blue. His pupils didn't react to light. He didn't breathe at all. And also the ambulance had tried to do some defibrillations in vain. So he was like a corpse when he was brought in. It was already cold as well. And then the nurse, the first thing the nurse did was to intubate the patients to give him more oxygen. When he tried to intubate the patients, he found out that he has dentures in the mouth, so he removed the upper dentures and put them somewhere on the crash cart. And they continued for about one and a half hour of resuscitation before the man had blood pressure, heartbeat again, which is quite uncommon, but he was a young man, so they did their best. But he was still unconscious. He didn't breathe, so he was intubated. He had artificial respiration. He was referred to the intensive care unit to continue artificial respiration for one week, he was in coma. And after one week, when he regained consciousness, was brought back to the cardiac ward. And he was just there when the nurse came in for medication. And he saw the nurse and said, you know where my dentures are. And he told the nurse, you were there when I was brought into a hospital. You took the dentures out of the mouth. You put it on the crash. There was a car with all those bottles in it. There was a slide underneath it. There you have put my teeth. And you could describe all the, the nurses and doctors who were busy with the resuscitation, who could describe the resuscitation room from above where he was brought into in coma. Was he referred to the ICU in coma? He's just been there in coma. He could describe the nurse with all the details from above. So that was a quite striking event of out of body experience with objective verification about what he had seen. Did this happen in Holland? Yes. Okay, so... And it's, it's, it's also it's published in The Lancet as well. It's published in my book as well. Yeah, I read it. I had read it. I, I knew the story, but I didn't know that you had personally uh, witnessed this. Did you resuscitate him? No, I... Did he come... 
There were 10 hospitals. It was one of the 10 hospitals, I, but I spoke to the nurse personally. Oh, okay. So you did not talk to him, but to the nurse. Yeah. Okay. What about the people who you have resuscitated and told you about their experiences? Which one was more striking or the ones that you remember the most? I cannot tell you. I've, I've spoken to more than 1,000 people personally share the NDE with me. I have had more than 10,000 emails from all over the world, people who share the NDE with me. And every story I heard is emotional. I'm always touched by it. I always resonate with them as well. So it, it's overwhelming. And people are willing to share the NDE. And the, I'm very grateful they are willing to do it. So there's not a specialty. Everybody who shared any with me is a very impressive story, always. How have these uh, stories influenced your personal belief about life, death, consciousness, spirituality? Of course. <laughs> I, I was raised as a materialist, materialist uh, cardiologist. So I was convinced as a young doctor that consciousness was a product of brain function. And during our study we did on survival of cardiac arrest, my view changed. And now I'm convinced that the brain has a facilitating function to experience consciousness, not a producing function. So the brain functions as an interface or a transceiver or a filter, whatever you would call it. And consciousness is always everywhere, inside and outside your body. I just receive when you have a functioning brain, just a part, small part of this non-local consciousness as your waking consciousness, and just a small part of all the memories you have in your waking consciousness. But when you're out of your body, you have memories from early childhood as well. So there are far more in your consciousness than you receive in your waking consciousness. And to, to, to understand this, always compared with the internet, with the iCloud, there, there are one billion websites or one billion YouTube films in the, in the iCloud. And when you shift on your computer, you can receive websites or YouTube wherever you are. But your computer does not produce the website and does not produce the YouTube, but it receives it. So and that's the same with the brain. The brain receives parts of your consciousness. When you have your computer on, you don't receive the one billion websites at the same moment. Uh, and it's the same for, for your telephone. There are hundreds, thousands of telephone calls going through you also in the room there or now. And hundreds of television and radio programs going through you as well. And the one million websites are now in your room as well as electromagnetic informational field. But you need a function instrument to receive them. And that's the principle of how we can see the brain as well. So how does the spiritual world fit in with this theory? And um, how do the presence of dead people fit in also with this? Well, when you die, your consciousness is still there in the non-local realm. There's a continuity of consciousness. One of the titles of my latest article, which was in the, in the Biblio essay contest. So there's a continuity. When you die, your body dies. It's the end of your physical aspects. But your consciousness will never die. It's eternal, it will always be there. And we know it also by, by people in the, in the, in the end, the ethics where you can meet people who are deceased, but also in the after death communication, we know that about 125 million people in Europe and 100 million people in the USA have after death communication. They usually they don't talk about it because they say, oh, it's just a dream or they don't, they don't dare to talk about it. But when you're open, when you ask about it, they will tell you. So it happens. And when you have an after-death communication, then you're sure that the consciousness of the diseased loved one is still there. Have you been researching also the interpretation of uh, spiritualists like Alan Kardec, Swedenborg, who talk about the spiritual world? And is there any relation with what you have studied? Well, the relation is, is using different words. I never use the word spiritual world. I, I use the word non-local real, where everything is available. And that's what Swedenberg had as well, what Kardec had as well. So it's the same, but the words they use are different. What they try to express to you 
This is the essence to say. So according to this, what all religions mention about this spiritual world is a different interpretation of this non-local realm, right? I mean, they give it different explanations and they interpret it differently. But are you a religious person or a spiritual person? I don't know what your definition is from a religious and spiritual. First okay. of all, that the basis of all religion has been this kind of experiences. That's the basis of all religions. If you have the Vedas and Upanishads, you read them. Maybe the Buddha, Buddhist, the Gnostic Christianity, the Anthroposophy, whatever, the Sufis, they all have based on this kind of experiences. But you can read it in the Bible as well. But when you ask me if I'm religious, religion is a Latin word, is reconnect, re or regere, reconnect. So I reconnect, so I'm religious. That has nothing to do with the church. So I'm a religious. Yes. And you can call it spiritual if you want to. But there are so many people who have different ideas about sp sp spirituality. So I prefer to say religious. It means I'm connected to the higher realms as well. Yeah, but what you just said mentioned, uh, what you just said reveals that you have been uh, researching. You talk about the Sufis, the Gnostics, the yeah. different, the Upanishads. So I yeah. figure that you have been doing some research and yes uh, the difference my how i define the difference is religion is an institution created by man and spirituality is basically these exp are basically these ex spiritual experiences that are basically ineffable like william james said they are they are always ineffable and yeah. they have other three characteristics but so we talk about the same thing <laughs> It's yes. just the same thing. It's just the same. But we use different words. What are your next your next steps for your research? Or what are you working on right now? I'm not doing research anymore. I think the most important thing now is that still a lot of people don't know anything about their death experiences. A lot of people don't know anything in the medical world. So doctors, nurses don't know anything about their death experiences. People, patients need help when they have these kind of experiences as well. It's the same for after death communication. People must understand that when you have, when you have been in contact with the, uh, the consciousness of a deceased relative, it's real. It means that the consciousness is still there when they have died. So what I'm doing is giving lectures, writing articles, and doing a lot of interviews on Zoom, etc. as well, also in the Netherlands, but also international, because I want to share my ideas with others to help people to open themselves and to see that materialist science does not fit with the ideas and the conclusions we have from research and the death experiences and all the other experiences of enhanced consciousness. You need a new kind of science, what we call the post-materialist science, which includes subjective experiences. Do you think that knowing about this helps people lose fear of death and helps people understand what's going on? I'm, I'm quite convinced, yes. It happens for me, but people who are open and interested and listen and read about the death experience or see films or see interviews, interviews about people who had an ND or scientists talking about an ND, it will change their life. They will change their insight in life and death as well. And the way the, our ideas about death define how we live our life as well. And when we just believe that and death is the end of everything we are, we just give all our energy to money and luxury and big houses, big cars, whatever, we have beautiful bodies, beautiful clothes. It's not the essence. The essence is something else. Where you know that there's a continuity of consciousness, then you will try to connect with, with, with other people, with nature plants and animals to save the world to save the planet for the future of our grandchildren as well so the, the way you live is totally different when you understand that there's a continuity of consciousness and death is not the end of who you are a lot of people who have had near-death experiences come back believing in reincarnation what is your view on reincarnation 
It's not special to be a people who have a near death experience. It's not typical for reincarnation ideas. But when you know that consciousness will be there always in the local realm, and that your life is a kind of trying to, to, to learn things which you need, then you will come back to learn other things as well. So reincarnation is accepted in Buddhism and Hinduism, in the Kabbalah, in the Sufis, in the Anthroposophy, in, 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 the, in the indigenous people religions. It's normal. But the last 300 years, we forgot it in the Western world. And the Ayn Sivas had done wonderful studies about the reincarnation as well. So I always think reincarnation is a possibility. It has said, there's no scientific proof but it is beyond reasonable doubt that there is reincarnation. I have heard from people who have had near-death experiences that they have remembered their past lives. Have you had any experience? No, that is rather rare. I've met two or three of those people. That's rather rare. But it happens. Okay. It happens. Have you ever had an afterlife communication or a mystical experience? No, not as far as I know. But I okay. Know and I resonate with all the people. And perhaps I had it as a child, small child, but I don't know. Do you do you think that your research has re, has influenced the view that the medical community has on these subjects? Well, I think when you are, know as a doctor that death is not the end, then you will change the way you treat terminal ill patients. You will change the way you treat patients in coma, you have different ideas about euthanasia, you have different ideas about organ donation, etc. So you change the way you treat patients totally. I'm convinced, yes. I, uh, I really like uh, in your book that you mention, you, know, you make like a summary of the NDE research history. You start mm -hmm. out talking about the domain researchers and you mentioned people like Bruce Grayson, Kenneth Ring, PMH Atwater, Melvin Moore, also Dr. Moore. I've met them all personally. They're all friends of mine. I oh, great. They've, they've been at, at my home. PMH, Ken Ring, Melvin Moore, Modi have been at my home as well, stayed there. And I've met them in the USA many times on conferences. Wow, great. Yeah, I'm, I'm great. really friends with Melvin Moore. I think he's a great guy. And he's really uh, interest, interesting. He's also uh, done some study on no, non-local consciousness. And I know. Uh, I still have to interview Bruce Grayson and Kenneth Ring. I haven't met them yet. Ken but, Ring is pretty uh, old. I don't think he will do it. He's, I know he's pretty old. Yes, he's, he's 88 or so. Yes. And I don't think he's about blind and he's, has physical problems. So I don't think he will do it. Because Grayson has, has recently a in, 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 in hip uh, replacement, so he's not healthy at this moment, so you should ask him later. Oh, okay. Uh, and Evan Alexander? You can yeah, I did. In, I interviewed him, okay. Evan Alexander. Okay. What would you tell someone who is about to die or who is close to death or is really old and is thinking about death all the time? How would you... What would you tell these people to calm them down? Or, you know, have you had a friend of yours who has had a terminal disease or a relative that you have helped with your studies and with what you've told them? Well, most hospices in Holland, there is my book. And people talk about it, family members talk about it, terminal patients know about it. So I'm, I'm, let's say in my, my book in Holland is now in the 30th print. 30th print, just in Holland alone. And I've given lectures to hospitals, hospices, doctors, universities, medical students, nurses, whatever. So they know me in Holland quite well. So it, it's, it's normal to know about the death experience and, after, uh, and, and end of life experiences as well. So I can refer to interviews, I can refer to my book and ask people what they think about life and death as well. I prefer to do it in questions and not in trying to convince people. But one of the stories I remember is that 
was a doctor, general practitioner, who went twice a day to a man who was dying at home. And he was frightened to die. And once the doctor came back and there the man was lying in bed, happy, smiling. I said, what happened to you? He said, Jan came by and talked to me. Jan was his neighbor who died two years before. So you had an after that communication, he came by and that changed his ideas about life and death. And he was very happy and quiet and he could die very peacefully because of the meeting of the deceased friend he had. So these kind of stories are, are, are important. I personally think that NDEs have changed humanity ever since humanity existed. I think right. that in the, in the prehistoric days, people who had NDEs became leaders and also the, the, the life review is an important factor because this transforms people and makes them more Christian or they make them more think they they make them think about others more they make them more humble and even in prehistoric days I think that they develop like powers like healing powers telepathy so these became like the shamans of the first prehistoric tribes. And they became the first leaders and the first spiritual guides. So yeah. I think NDEs have had a big influence in, in mankind. And they could be like I, a natural I, process. I agree with you totally. It was the basis of all the world religions as well. I always say that the aboriginals in Australia don't need a mobile phone, they can communicate with 300, 500 miles with each other without a phone. Yes, I, I never heard that. Yes. Where did you find that out? <laughs> they don't need a mobile phone, they just can communicate at a distance. Yes, that's interesting. Well, that also happens to us sometimes when, you know, the phone rings and you know who's calling. Exactly. Or, so yeah. it's a non-local connection. I always... Consciousness is for me is fundamental in the universe, together with energy and, and information. Everything that we have in the physical world is a construct of consciousness. So it starts with consciousness in the universe. It starts with energy and information. And everything what we experience in our physical world is a product of our consciousness. But everything right. comes from the base, which is one. Right. Also, the quantum physics talks about entanglement. So we are all entangled. That's what I said. Instantaneous, interconnected with everything and everybody. No time, no space. Well, thanks a lot. I am really honored to have interviewed you. I wish you success with your search for unity in the world. Thank you. It was a pleasure.